November 2024's astrology is a big month of very active astrology. I think there's a sense this month of recovering from eclipse season, finally getting back into some real outer world engagement in ways that we haven't been able to for the last few months with not much fire element in the sky and with eclipse season. Robust interaction with making our realities how they might want to be made or how we might want to make them. A month when you have a lot going on in the politics in America, so there's that sense of passionate action in the outer world that is the nature of politics itself. That's reflected in the astrological symbol set in the transiting sky. We kick off the month with a new moon in Scorpio, so there is some continuation with the emotionality of October here in November. Mars will enter Leo early in the month and it's double fire. Mars the planet of fire, Leo a sign of fixed fire, so it gets quite fiery and quite active. Venus will enter Capricorn, finally getting some dignity back to settle us into some comfort and relational conversation about the longevity and stability of how we're relating. And then final ingress, this cycle, settling us finally and officially and irrevocably into this new Pluto and Aquarian world, the age of air and the age of Aquarius, this sub age of Aquarius, you might say. I'm astrologer SJ Anderson. Join me, another breakdown of the month ahead. We're gonna look into the month, feel into the symbols, talk about how it might affect us both collectively and interpersonally. Stay with me here. Glad you're here and glad to have you. November 2024's astrology coming right up. So we kick off a month with a new moon in Scorpio, right on the first of the month, UTC 1247, nine degrees, 35 degree minutes right in Scorpio. Always interesting when you kick off a month with new energy, it can kind of be a chance to use this month to maybe start with that first day on the calendar with new things in an area of your life, initiating new things, starting new things. So check that Scorpio house because there's a chance for some newness to come in there uh, here right on the first of the month. So we continue here in November, this very emotional time. Mars in Cancer, Saturn in Pisces, the seriousification of the emotional states and taking our emotional body seriously. If there's heaviness and weightedness, of course, I mean, you've got Mars and Saturn and these water signs, Scorpio will be trining them both. So I think there's still opportunities, those opportunities extending from October to work with the emotional body and process those challenging emotions. We get that also here in November. This new moon doesn't have Venus or Jupiter making an aspect to it. And so there is a layer here, maybe the hope being removed at some level, just symbolically. So if it's a little bit tougher emotionally, Mars towards the end of Cancer, nearing that anoretic degree, that unstable degree as it's about to change signs. Mars opposite Pluto right here, very close in orb. You know, it's a tough new moon, I think, given that Mars's condition is so dramatically sh strained. And so that is, could be part of the emotional body, the emotional states that you might be working with. Again, less of the hope and more of the challenge, frothy emotive uh, uh, triggering, you might say. I think we're in a time of triggering with Mars slow. This new moon may introduce you into aspects of your emotional body that maybe haven't been around yet and it might not be altogether smooth. But that's also, you know, the silver lining is when we go into the pain and we say, this is how it feels to hurt. We sometimes excavate things that have been under the surface or things that need to come up to be healed or it's just an opportunity for healing, an opportunity for growth and healing anytime there's emotional triggering. So you can be aware of that and use the challenge, use the challenge to see it and integrate it. So this is also a great time, I think, with the new moon in Scorpio ruled by Mars to consider two things. One, when Mars entered Cancer on 4 September, what happened? What's been going on in your Cancer sector from 4 September? You know, all of the actions, this initial active phase of the Mars retrograde cycle with Mars and Cancer, what was triggered up, what things were introduced, what actions and strides did you make in that area? Because now we get Mars as it enters Leo three days after this new moon and there's a new phase of the Mars story that's coming in here. What's the new understanding of Mars as time in Cancer? that it's given you and then now that we're turning over to Mars and Leo here, another theme of this month, that's a kind of new martial story may be embedded here in this new moon. And so yeah, just starting fresh with our Mars retrograde stories, embracing a new what has emerged, telling ourselves new narratives to adapt to how we want to play reality as it's unfolded or emerged in our lives great with the new moon to get a chance to do that. So the Sun in Scorpio will trine Saturn on the 4th of November, the day that Mars enters Leo. Again, we're into the Scorpionic emotional depth, the motivational identities, 
flowing with Saturn's new structures within the dream realm. And this may, again, be more introspection, more dreams, more courage, more facing emotion and trying to see where we can propel the self into some new structure and new groundedness around these emotional bodies. You gotta face the darkness in life, we've gotta face it. And we're coming up here to that US election on the 5th of November, and it's dark. I mean, you turn on the news, there's all kinds of darkness. No matter your party of preference, I mean, it's just an intense and triggered time. And I think that could be part of the emotionality that the astrology is keying us into. So you might want to watch how triggered you are emotionally around those news stories and try to contain and protect yourself a little bit if you can. And this all leads to, again, these themes of emotionality on the 15th when Saturn stations direct. A huge deal to have Saturn stationing direct. It's very much a highlight and a pivot in all of the Saturn and Pisces stories. This is the second direct station of Saturn this cycle in Pisces. So again, I mean, just put up Pisces in your chart. You got a 10th house Pisces, what's happening in your career this month as Saturn is stopping? What new foundational layers are being established as Saturn had laser-like focus in your 10th house and is now moving forward? So that's Gemini rising, folks. It's all about these career inflection, Saturn being great rank, Saturn laying a new foundation in career. Kamala Harris, of course, is a Gemini rising. So this, if she wins, is about her new role, Saturn stopping there in her 10th house. Just as an example, we all need to do this in our charts. We all need to examine it and process this moment of, hey, Saturn has been trying to strip things away, giving us a task that might be taking time and effort to establish something new in a sector of our lives and in our charts. And this is the month to dive into that. And it very well may be about dreamscapes and emotionality and visioning and religiosity and yearning, that's all the Piscean themes, and creativity. There's some kind of struggle we've been tasked with around those themes that now we get to check in around. So it's exciting, because now Saturn is moving forward. It won't station retrograde until mid-2025. Saturn stationing direct is keying us into Saturn entering Aries in May, because it enters Aries from this direct station pivot. So we're getting some new Saturn stories. We're well on the way. What structures, what's the depth of your dream, defining the dream, articulating your desire, articulating what you want to see for yourself, all key ways to move into and maneuver with a symbol set of Saturn and Pisces. Great ways to maneuver within that, making tangible the vision. One of the more interesting charts this month is the chart on 18 November, this Cancer Moon. Uh, early as it ingresses into Cancer, the Moon will apply to Venus, newly in Capricorn. This Cancer Moon, 18 November, 19 November, first Cancer Moon we will have since Mars has left Cancer. And so the Moon gets its home back. It doesn't have to have a troublesome guest, you might say, in its home sign. So I think this Cancer Moon, one of my favorite charts of the month, resting after the full Moon. So this uh, Venus and Capricorn finally gets some dignity back. The Moon here comes to Cancer, aspects Venus. There's a nice little exchange here, two rulers, right? Venus and the Moon share rulership over the Earth sign Capricorn by triplicity. Venus also rules Cancer by triplicity where the Moon finds its home. So there's this very nurturance and restful and pleasurable opportunity here right after the full Moon. A moment to settle into our home world the chaos of the election in the United States. Maybe that's going to jostle us. Maybe there'll be amazing events that are unlike anything we've ever seen. Pluto finishing out its time in Capricorn and we're triggered here into some kind of crazy outer reality thing. So whatever shenanigans Mars and Leo has kicked up starting on the 4th of November, this might be a moon where we can settle and rest and nurture a little bit as a way to heal or treat those shenanigans. Remember how major of a sign Cancer is now in our zodiacal flow because we have Mars coming back to Cancer and stationing in February. It will be there until 18 April. Jupiter enters Cancer on 9 June. It stays there for a year. So Cancer and the sector of Cancer really is one that plays an important role with the relationship between the transiting planetary sky. This moon, 18 November, mid-month here in November, is a good one to touch base with your Cancer sector, checking in with yourself. How are the events there flowing? How was Mars there in September and October impacting that sector? And now you might get a little bit of a respite to settle and to review and prepare for Mars's 
coming back there in January 2025, right in the first uh, seven days of the year. So of course the wrinkle here is the moon is squaring its nodes. When the moon is angular to its nodes, that old Vettius Valens idea, we get a little bit uneasy because there is the nature of eclipses, the unexpected events that can come. But for my money, I'll take this Cancer energy. I'll take the moon not with Mars aspecting Venus. Remember, it's also very close to that Mercury and Jupiter opposition, which is a mutual reception, Mercury and Sagittarius, Jupiter and Gemini. So that is an element of this chart that I really like, the grandeur of vision brought through the particularity of analysis and how those two things fuse to often produce, you know, the most important breakthroughs that we can have. We have the big picture and the small detailed planning to allow the big picture to manifest. The moon is averse to those planets, however, but still that's a larger part of the moment in time. Finding home within the chaos, 18 November, moon opposite Venus, moon and Cancer opposite Venus and Capricorn. Enjoy this one. So if you're interested in this kind of analysis, I have a Patreon that includes weekly emails where you'll get my analysis similar to this for moons every week. Uh, I like to look at most of the moons and the ones that I'm enjoying more than others. Newsletter called Lunar Signals, Patreon, SJ Anderson, 144 over there, the link will be in the description. The big part of November, the fire element, the Sagittarian pile up. In November from the 4th to the 11th, where Mars, Mercury, and Venus are all in fire signs. We'll have Mars in Leo, Mercury and Venus in Sagittarius, and then the moon will be in Sagittarius during that stretch. The moon spins time in Sagittarius on the 4th and 5th, so the day that Mars enters Leo, you have those four of the seven traditional and fire signs. Fire element, it's waking up and feeling like life is interesting. You know, kids have a lot of fire element. They just wanna get up. They, they have a will to live, a desire to be alive, and an excitement about the fact of their existence. And that's what we wanna see with the fire element, trying to tap into what makes us go. You know, what is there to be excited about and to be engaged with in the outer world, mostly when we think about the fire element. And so, you know, what are you living for? Uh, and I would tap into that strongly. I would feel into that and, and make that a primary query here in November. This doesn't have to be as much of an intellectual answer as just what gets you engaged. You know, trying to feed that and give time to that, especially right here this 4, 5 to 11 November when you have these planets in fire signs. When Venus shifts to Capricorn, some of that focus changes. So Mercury enters Sagittarius on the 2nd of November. Thoughts may multiply. Jupiter ruled Mercury's are known for that. Just talking and a lot of words and a lot of ideas. Take it from someone who has a Jupiter or Mercury, myself, Mercury and Pisces. There's just a constant brainstorm, constant flow of brain activity and linguistic activity almost at all times. Mercury and Sag may bring a, a more outer engagement version of that, but just be aware, a lot of words. Main theme of November starts on the second and it's the election month. So a lot of stuff will be out there about this election, a lot of ideas. If you don't wanna be inundated with that, you might wanna try to turn it off as much as you can, or just be aware that the astrology is saying an overload of information as a primary theme of this month. And at Mercury and Sagittarius, a couple of themes about it, trying to speak truth, right? Trying to passionately share the true nature of what we see as true, trying to articulate forms of justice and wisdom. So if you're gonna be engaging in some of those dialogues, you may wanna to try to restrict some of the nature of what is being shared to Jupiterian style goals. And that might help us you know, align with this symbolism and groove here with this astrology. You know, Sagittarius, looking out beyond what we've known. Go to the library to get a book. Go to a bookstore in a, a new section. Read a book from someone you haven't read before. These are all the ideas of Sagittarian expansion and moving out from into new worlds. Mutable sign, mutable fire. The passions are leading us into new initiations and through the mercurial models, books, language, ideas, analysis. And of course, the U.S. Sibley chart is the Sagittarius rising. The U.S. is in focus this month, obviously, right, because of the presidential election, but that transiting astrology also keying us into to that. Look for conversations if you're living abroad. Look for those to be U.S.-centric. A lot of times you hear criticism, people say, why do you U.S. astrologers only talk about the U.S.? There's other countries. Well, give us a break this month. <laughs> you know, with all of the planets in Sagittarius and with the U.S. presidential election. That mutual reception with Jupiter and Mercury all month, Jupiter and Gemini, Mercury and Sagittarius, can be good for trying to 
articulate the rationale of a bigger idea, of a larger set of hopes and dreams, bringing those back through specific words and phrases. And so I think there could be a unique opportunity here to uh, make manifest through specific detailed descriptions what it is we want to be doing. And that energy peaks when Mercury opposes Jupiter on the 18th. So right here mid-month, 18 degrees, they will perfect the first of three oppositions. So a little before this, Mercury will square Saturn on the 12th of November, the first of three squares to Saturn. That is now triggering, you see that T-square again, immutable signs, and that's why I think this month can be a little bit chaotic. Way too much information, way too much unreality of information. The unreality of Saturn and Pisces brought about by the way too much information of Jupiter and Gemini, a lot of it not true, Gemini being lies, Jupiter trying to sift through the truth of what the lies are, Mercury and Sagittarius of like the passionate expressions of those things. And so I think there'll be a lot of just untruths and words and phrases and ideas just thrown around probably irresponsibly and it might not feel good at all. So, you know, you're going to Thanksgiving, this could be defining the Thanksgiving period. A lot of that, Uncle Tim's crazy, he believes this stuff, and then Uncle Tim is like, you're wrong, and people debating the results of the election. I think there'll be unavoidably some of that. It's a square in opposition, T-square. Mercury opposing Jupiter, squaring Saturn. That means we can't get out of it. That means we're forced into processing it all. And so when you know that, that does provide some relief on the one hand, and two, maybe you can have some strategies here. You might want to even practice, like, excuse me, it's just not something I want to talk about here. No, thank you. Politely declining participation or just going into it. Nothing wrong with just saying, let's have the debates. Let's go. And really engaging expressions of big picture ideas and of depth of truth. The world is changing. We're in a mutable period, Jupiter and Saturn immutable signs. We're in between two states. Next year's cardinal initiation in summer is that world that we're becoming, but now it's this mutable time. And having Jupiter and Mercury mutually receiving each other does allow for trying to sift through and express that. In a certain sense, this is the time to kind of just throw everything on the wall, express anything you want to express, and try to discover some truth, try to get that foundational Saturn energy here, feel that here. And then finally, Mercury does station retrograde, 22 degrees Sagittarius on the 26th of November, and that is the time when you might have the most blocks and delays and most challenging energy of this Mercury retrograde. Plan around this, all of this stuff we say every time. Back up your data, don't travel if, if you don't have to on this date, and let that Mercury peak happen. And then as it goes backward, you'll be able to integrate some of what Mercury is doing there but always preparing i never do important stuff on the dates of the station i've learned my lesson too many times that i just never do you know anything if i can avoid it around the time of that uh, retrograde station and i think this will be a chaotic mercury retrograde maybe one of the more chaotic ones i've seen in a while because of the immutable t-square with jupiter and saturn this is going to be one we might have to be questioning beliefs and words and getting new information and everything is put into play. And so just like with Mars retrograde in Leo, I think we will have to not only challenge our ego formations this month, but also challenge our belief sets and the facts that we attach ourselves to. That's all in play here for like a chaotic swirl and a mixing and a review. Maybe the biggest story of the month is Mars entering Leo. Part of it is how and when it will enter Leo, which is right at the beginning of the month, because on the 3rd of November, Mars will perfect the opposition to Pluto. Remember, Pluto's moving forward, about to enter Aquarius this month. Mars is moving forward faster than Pluto right now, entering Leo, stationing retrograde, and going back over the boundary between Leo and Cancer in January 2025, and then moving forward from February. Mars will oppose Pluto three times this cycle, and this is the first of three, right when both are in this unstable anoretic degree, that final degree of a sign where things get strange because you're having to let go of something knowing that you're about to create a new energy for yourself. And so it's always, it's like the night before you're about to leave for a trip. It's just a little bit anxious. Are you ready? Has everything been prepared for, taken care of? Mars triggers Pluto. Mars is faster moving. Mars is of the nature of triggers of great force and closer in time triggers Pluto's longer term transformational processes. So to have Mars triggering Pluto here right before the evening of the election, interpersonally, you've got to watch your own you know, addiction to the polls and to the news. I mean, we're all going to be transfixed at some level because there's a great desire for a lot of people to find the result or to learn 
the result of their reality. Look, this election, I'm going to have a whole other video on the election that I'll release before this day on the 4th, probably around the time of this Mars-Pluto opposition, but it's uncertain and we just don't know what's going to happen and there's a lot at stake for a lot of people. The global transformational period that we're entering into, 2025 and 2026, this election, Mars opposite Pluto on the eve of it, I think tells us the gravity and importance of the result of this election in terms of the milieu of meaning that we will carry into those very powerful transformative years, 2025 and 2026. Power dynamics, that's, that's a Pluto theme. Mars triggering, maybe fighting over dynamics and power dynamics. It is what an election is about, is that. So it fits that symbolism precisely. Eve of the election, surprising unfoldment, you always have to keep that in mind. But especially when you have Mars and Pluto perfecting an opposition, the eve of the election. So something like 18 hours later, Mars enters Leo. So let's just delineate Mars and Leo, setting aside its speed and then the fact that it's very slow and about the station retrograde, because there will be some of this in the Mars and Leo unfoldment. This isn't removed just because Mars is slow, but it is the notion of fire plus fire. Mars is the planet of fire, Leo is the fixed fire sign. You have this very fiery combination. What might that mean for you? Well, if you're feeling impassioned, feeling engaged, feeling desirous and wanting to uh, unleash yourself into the world around you, whether that's interpersonally, or collectively or what have you. I do think it fits with people responding to the result of the election and being actively engaged passionately with the world and how the world is forming after the election. So there's that side of it. Confident, bold action, not hesitating to initiate the selfhood and inject that selfhood into the world around you. Expressing your opinions politically. I mean, that would be shown here and you may wanna be aware that the astrology is kind of like a flamethrower just and you don't want to torch things around you you know so you may want to kind of be careful to temper or tame some of this fiery some of these flames because you don't want to torch people in terms of the slowing speed of mars and the retrogradation i think immediately four five six november right when it enters you've got to be asking yourself what is happening in the leo sector because now the part of the mars retrograde story that is contained in those leo house topics mars is there triggering those up for the first time what facts emerge, what passionate actions arise, what things uh, are triggered that you've got to now note you may be dealing with them for a lot longer than you would in a normal Mars and Leo year. Because it might be quite obvious, sometimes it is with the transit, it's just boom, those house topics triggered, Mars, boom, now you're dealing with that. And we know Mars won't leave Leo finally until 18 June. So it's gonna be a longer process with Mars and Leo. 18 June 2025 is when it's completed. And that's why it's important to pay attention because you're giving yourself a heads up around timing of what emerges. With the retrograde, see that's one of the main themes of Mars retrograde in Leo and stationing retrograde in Leo on 5-6 December is that we have to review who we are. The ego structures that we think have served us and that we're bringing here into late 2024, those could be smashed a little bit here. And I think it's part of the election results. I mean, we feel so impassioned about politics and what if the world is changing in ways, and it is, and we'll have to navigate how we have ego-based attachments to certain things as these results come in. And the classic case, I mean, astrologers are gonna have to. And there's a lot of astrologers. It's like many have predicted Harris, many have predicted Donald Trump. That's just one example of the kind of ego reconstruction that a Mars retrograde and Leo can apply. This may apply across industry, various industries, various areas of life where we're having to say, hey, I thought about myself as this way, or I thought that I was like this, or this was gonna be a certain way, and then boom, Mars comes, stations retrograde. Nope, you gotta reconstruct it, rebuild it. And there you go, the next day after Mars enters Leo is the November presidential election on the 5th of November. So you can see how intense this early November moment is going to be. Be aware that the astrology is making it more combustive and more transformative than it might otherwise be in a different year. And the only other trends that I wanna point out here about Mars in Leo right now is that the sun will trine Mars at the end of the month. The sun will enter Sagittarius on the 21st of November. Then these two planets of fire will be in fire signs and trining each other. And that can be the positive side of fire. You know, Mars and Leo is ruled by the sun. The sun will be receiving Mars 
What are the positive sides of fire? Well, it's wonderful to be engaged in the world. It's wonderful to have an ego, actually. We need to have a healthy ego or we can't function. It's great to have an identity and know who we are and know what we want and then know what we want to achieve and seek based on being a lit up with life, you know, engaged and lit effectively. So look for that towards the end of the month. Even as Mars is grinding way slower towards the end of the month, the sun trining it on the 27th of November may help bring a brief respite from the grinding energy and may help clarify again what we'll be working with longer term and maybe release us from some of that grind town vibe that a Mars retrograde can bring about and often is about. All of November, Mars is slow, enters Leo slower, 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 slower. I'm feeling it already. I don't know about you all, but the last week uh, here in October, just frustration in the air. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people. It's just this sense of being trapped or bound. And that's always what happens during a Mars retrograde, just in general, because Mars does signify those things, movement, force, passion, action, fervor, power, and building and making. And so as it's slowing, we just not able to quite do as much or feel like we're as productive. So if you're finding frustration as a keyword, that could increase here in November. And it might become even more frustrating because it's fire frustration. And frustration is of the fire element in a way. So Mars now in a fire signing even slower, just be prepared to manage your frustration. Be prepared to embrace Sisyphusian models of life. You know, the notion that we just have to kind of grind sometimes. There's just no escape. No one gets out and you've got to work and grind and you know, try to keep a smile and love in your heart, 100%. But life sometimes forces a quotidian framework of feeling maybe less, less free, you know, a restriction uh, of action. And that's here in November. So just be aware of that main theme of November. So the Venus cycle has been a big story over the last little bit, because remember Venus was in Libra, then it came into Scorpio. Venus was in Scorpio for that solar eclipse in Libra in early October. Late September, Venus entered Scorpio. Then it entered Sagittarius, a sign where it's less uh, robust, potentially. It's not the worst sign for Venus, but it doesn't have the place that it likes to be. Sagittarius is a masculine sign. It's a sign of fire and passion of the outer world. Uh, it's not as much a sign focused on the beauty of the self and the relationship. But finally here in November, on the 11th, 1825 UTC, Venus will enter Capricorn. Venus gets to rest a little bit and refocus its goals. Remember, Venus is a beautiful evening star. It has strength with the synodic cycle with the sun. And now it has this Capricornian energy from which it can settle. We might shift to more uh, long-term planning around the relationship. What's really real? The depth of the people around us. What do we really like? What's really pleasurable? All of these things are evoked here. Long-term solutions to relationship and pleasure, which is important because a lot of relationships can be fleeting. A lot of pleasures can be fleeting. We get to begin to examine those topics, those Venusian topics through a longer term stable view. Relationships and life cycles, astrological patterns of personal experience by Stephen Arojo, very famous astrologer, very well known, books all over the world. So he was an astrologer very popular in the 70s and into the 80s. Curious about what happened to him. Uh, I wonder what's going on with Mr. Arroyo these days. But from this text, he writes, Venus and Capricorn especially needs a really deep love and they're short changing themselves if they hold on to something just for security. And so that becomes the task. You know, do we have only a security focused view of our relationships? Is it only about the practical long-term implications? Are we going to also look for the depth of love, that higher octave maybe of Capricorn and of Saturn? And you may be dancing with and solving some of these themes in your own world. Venus will sextile its domicile Lord Saturn on the 22nd. So 11 days later, Venus has support from Saturn at this time. It's that dreamlike Saturn and Pisces, that surreal Saturn and Pisces, infusing Venus and Capricorn with maybe more of a dreamy component. So maybe you're doing vision boarding here, like long-term planning using the Piscean. Vision board work would be wonderful for Venus and Capricorn in my view. Things like who can you rely on? Planning for 2025, Mars is retrograding here very, very soon. It's slowing down all of November. I think it's a great time to think about who can we rely on? Who are the people that you rely on? Who are the people that you allow to rely on you? These are core questions with Venus in Capricorn. I've been on farms before and like yoga retreats out in the middle of nowhere. And it really becomes about who's doing what. You know, you're a unit. People are a unit of functionality and we have tasks to support the whole. This may be what we're called into here is, you know, what is your obligation to the people around you? How are they obligated to you? And 
making sure that there's some cohesion in that structuring for functionality, for making and doing, right? We have to make and do. We have to figure out who's responsible for what to get food on the table, right? And that becomes the Venus and Capricorn view or theme. So the full moon in Taurus, 15 November, late in the evening, 2128 UTC, it's a Venus and Capricorn ruled full moon. We've got the moon in Taurus ruled by that Venus fresh in Capricorn. And so these Capricornian themes extend into the mid-month peak of this full moon energy. Taurus is often thought of as of stability, comfort. You see people like the laziness of Taurus or something like this. I think a lot of those significations would actually apply to Venus and Capricorn. Not that it's lazy in Capricorn, but it's about stability as a keyword in Capricorn, probably more than Taurus because of the Saturn and Mars ruled nature of Capricorn, two planets that take things seriously and they're all about solving problems. So that's what stability is. Stability is the nature of protecting oneself from incursion. That Venus and Capricorn trining by sign, the full moon in Taurus, we're right in here. A Venus and Capricorn month with the full moon being ruled by it. The wrinkle with this full moon, of course, is Uranus and Taurus is right next to the full moon. I mean, within two degrees. And that invokes just the theme of surprises, twists and turns, upheavals, true surprises that are fast moving, like lightning. And so be prepared for that. I think about this more in the context of the news and the mundane astrology, often how I like to work with Uranus. And I mean, I'm watching these headlines every day. It's accelerating even more into these wild, like global war themes that we had last time Uranus was in Taurus. It's highly concerning, actually. I mean, we're very close to major, major shifts with these outer planets. 2025, of course, being extreme for that. The video I just released went into how the ingress of Uranus in July is the final piece to where all outer planets are now for the first time together in their new signs. Some of the news headlines I'm seeing, Iran bracing for a strike from Israel. It could snowball very, very fast. I mean, that's a tinderbox and that would be a trigger. Let's hope it's just more of a symbolic retaliation and it's not some major tinderbox trigger. The new headline that North Korean troops are now in Ukraine uh, fighting with the Russians. And so you again see the globalization of conflict which fits with Uranus and Taurus. Last time it was at these degrees was 1940, you know, 3940 into 41. We're, we're resonant with that now. So the headlines are matching it. And all I can say is, you know, universe, love, help us, God, please intervene. We can implore the heavens and the divine energies to please intervene. We're gonna need it. We're gonna need an elegant landing here to collectively work through global conflict. And Uranus and Taurus, the reason why I'm bringing it up here is Uranus and Taurus is the timing piece for that. This full moon is right with Uranus and Taurus. So it evokes that in terms of the local trigger that the moon is. Remember too, uh, Mars is square by sign. Uh, Mars in early Leo squaring this full moon in late Taurus, but that Mars in early Leo is quite concerning. Given that uh, the J6 events in America, so J6 is the stuff that happened during the inauguration period, uh, in 2020, the inauguration of Joe Biden. Remember the guy that was the QAnon shaman? He had the horns. All of us astrologers were saying, hey, that's Mars and Taurus, the war uh, bull. And so this QAnon shaman stepped into symbolic accuracy of this war bull. That was when Mars was at zero Taurus, or the first degree of Taurus. So upon Mars's entry into Leo, we're now getting resonant with those events of January 6th, this full moon coming within the first weeks after the election. I already saw in Arizona, one of the counties down there, Maricopa County, said they're not going to count ballots until maybe 13 days or something like this. It was right around the time of this full moon when ballot and final election results could be coming in. And it's this Uranian square Mars by sign. You just hope that it isn't going to be some kind of tense you know, shaking the fixity of reality with some real gyration, but it's written in the symbols. So just be aware of that. If you're watching headlines and election results are inducing anger or something like that, we got a, a Mars square moon, Taurus full moon with Uranus. Also, Mars is very slow here. And so you wonder what this is gonna kick up, this full moon in Taurus, squaring Mars, ruling the sun in Scorpio, that Mars, around the blocks and delays related to the Leo themes of Mars and Leo. So maybe we're gonna to have to realize the identities that we bring into this moment aren't sufficient to meet the moment and we're gonna have a real reflection period that might last for the next few months. Where we're having to say, hey, that's not working for me anymore to solve problems and to get the job done. And so I'm gonna to have to reconstruct my selfhood, Mars and Leo. That Mars is in, I think, three degrees in this full moon chart. It stations retrograde five or six degrees. So it's very close within three degrees of the degree of its retrograde station here by 15 November. 
want to talk about Pluto and Aquarius' entry over here by this water. Come with me. Come on with me. I love that sun coming down. Look at this, how it shines on the water. Really cool, I think, for the sun in Scorpio. Stagnant water and that sunlight hitting the stagnant water. You can get a reflection, the sun off of the water, only when the water's still or a good reflection. And this is a nature of the sun in Scorpio that it allows us to sometimes see things in a completely different way. We're seeing what we might say is the scorpionic depth and the sunlight reflected on the still water allows us to see something deeper than maybe we have seen. Sun will be in Scorpio in November. It will be there until I think the 21st of November. Keep that in mind. What's being reflected back to you this month? What are you being shown uh, with that sun in Scorpio energy? Pluto and Aquarius, final ingress of Pluto and Aquarius on the 19th of November. Huge, given that Pluto will never return to Capricorn. So this is the final goodbye. I don't want to say much more about it. I've spoken so much about this over and over. So many videos, you know, in the last two years. So you can just refer back to those. I'll link one here. I have a long Pluto and Aquarius video that dials in some of those themes. Dan Waits and I have done a couple on Pluto and Aquarius. Just know those big themes are innovation around technology, social, issues, challenging power, fight the power is Pluto and Aquarius, where we can transform the structures of the system so that it's more fair and the kings get weaker, the people get to transform against the kings. And then there is the themes of what is humanity? What is a human being? What does it mean to be a human being? Some of those definitions may get altered here as we come into new understandings of beingness, that part of the word, human being. It's a ING form ongoing process that is life. Moment to moment we continue to be one moment to the next. What does that mean? What is the true nature of that? Things like the idea of the rights of man in the Enlightenment period in the late 18th century. Things like the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century where there was new understandings of how an individual can access divinity. So I'm looking for things like that to fully come online here. And it may have to do with the technology as we're realizing how interconnected we all are. I think there's gonna be renewed understandings of things like synchronicity and interconnection of souls in this realm. Just as a few ideas here, greater interconnectivity of all beings, I think will be incorporated into how we understand the self, maybe more than we have up until this time. So some of the stories I'm watching just recently, Anthropic AI just released an AI model that will control your computer screen and it knows how to like click the mouse and then type things in. So you can just say, AI, take over my computer, go do some stuff and it can just work on your computer. It's like if you hired people for your business and you hired some humans to operate a computer. Now you can hire AIs to work at computer stations. So that's a huge deal. My change how we work. AI is certainly going to do that, but this was just the latest news. This was from a TechCrunch article. The model can imitate keystrokes, button clicks, and mouse gestures, essentially emulating a person sitting at a PC. That's powerful. I'm not saying it's any good right now, but I'm sure they're working on it and it'll eventually be great for certain tasks. But you know, the other thing is the month of November is a Plutonic month. Mars opposes Pluto, right, to kick off the month on the 3rd. And then Pluto enters Aquarius on the 19th. So what is Pluto? The themes of Pluto, the significations of Pluto, have those on your mind in November. Transformation, destroying for the purpose of transforming. It's destroying not for destruction's sake, but it's destruction that's necessary as a result of a deep truth being acknowledged. And then that deep truth has to destroy for it to flower and flourish. When we acknowledge truth, instantly whole worlds that we've built up get destroyed. Like if you say, okay, the truth is that, you know, I don't like this person I'm in a relationship. That's the truth. Then there's no way to go back. You can't go back and have dinner anymore, right? You know that truth and it's changed the dynamic because you've acknowledged and admitted something that maybe wasn't even available until the plutonic moment. So things like that, I think, could be here all month. And I just want to say again, back to the social political. I mean, we're now fully into this resistance as a theme, 20 years resisting power. And I want to speak a little bit about that here because that's also a theme of Saturn and Aries next summer and in 2026, 2027, 2028. And the student protests we saw this year against the war machine in America, I believe that is going to continue to be one of the main stories. As war pops off or as a result of this election, you might have, you know, warlike discourse, bellicose language from people in positions of power there will be a need to resist that collective resistance to war for profit, main theme. And so I'm looking for that 
to be a part of November, particularly second half after Pluto enters and settles finally into Aquarius, the fixed air sign of innovation and new structure. All right, that's it. That is November's astrology. Have a wonderful November, as best as you can. Chaotic month, mutable T-square, Mars slowing even more, U.S. presidential election, Mars opposite Pluto. So just hang on this month and as best as you can, maneuver through it with grace, dignity, and a spiritual centered focus. And get excited a little bit here. Some fire energy, a fire element month. Getting out into the world, addressing what it is that you're excited about in this world. Strongly supported here this month. And you can support me, like the channel, subscribe to the channel, follow me on Instagram, sjanderson233. Support me on Patreon, sjanderson144 there, just like I am here. Thank you for your support and I very much uh, wish you well and I'll talk very soon to you. Peace, best, take care.